Your Creative Force by Avian is currently available on Global Voice Radio. Talent is a flame. Genius is a fire. Broadcasting from the San Francisco Bay Area, the all-new all-hit show on creativity. Hosted by international award-winning artist and entrepreneur, Avian. Listening to your creative force. And now here's your host, Avian. Hi, this is Avian coming to you once again from the lovely San Francisco Bay Area in California, the USA. So today we are going to tackle the topic of hiring great employees. Now, if you remember our previous episode, that was about how to be a successful leader, right? Successful leadership in general and how to be a successful leader in your own organization. So today's episode, you can kind of say it's kind of like a part two of the previous episode 19. And if you haven't listened to episode 19, I seriously encourage you to do so because these two shows really go together. And if you listen to episode 19, 19 and episode 20 together, I think you will get a really good, thorough picture of what it means to be a good leader. And then out of that, of course, knowing how to hire great employees, right? And great employees, hiring great employees, it isn't always what people think it is. So we're going to look at that today. So episode 20 of your creative force today, hiring great employees, and we are going to jump in with both feet straight from the get-go, right? Like I started saying in our last show, our show is not for fluffy unicorns and candy, right? Our show has the good stuff. Our show is serious. It's about really building your business as an entrepreneur. And um, so we go through a lot of really great content in our show. So I'm hoping that you are saddling up and joining me for the ride today because I think this is going to be some good value for you in episode 20 today. That all being said, in episode 20, I want to discuss with you some criteria that small business owners and entrepreneurs can utilize in order to make sure they hire the right employees. Hiring the right employees is absolutely critical in ensuring that any organization functions and grows in an optimal way. Hiring goes way beyond just looking at a person's skill set. And this is something that I feel is often overlooked, right? You're in the middle of your journey. You desperately need to hire someone for help. And then they come to you as a potential hiree with skill sets and you are just so grateful that you finally found someone with the skill sets that you need that you just go ahead and hire them. But that is not really a very smart way of hiring because skill set is only one aspect of what we should really be looking at when we hire people, right? People are more than their skills. People have personal lives, they have circumstances, they have characters, right? And they have personalities. And all of that are those are things they bring to the table, so to speak. And if you overlook all those things, and you only go for skill set, you may end up creating trouble for yourself that you could have avoided, right? (laughs) So we are going to look at some of that today. Okay, there are deep things we need to consider if we want a new hire to fit into the culture and help grow the business. There is a great difference between just hiring someone to do a job for you and hiring someone to actually be part of your long term journey in your organization. Right. We are not only talking about just hiring a person. We are also talking about retaining 
good people. Because hiring someone is one thing, but if you have a huge turnover of employees, you've got a problem because that means that you don't know how to keep your good people and your good people, somehow they are not really happy in your organization long term and they're leaving. And if you have an issue with retaining good people in your business, you really have to seriously consider taking a hard look at why they leave your business. Okay. Usually one of two things happen here. Either people leave a business, so you have a difficult time retaining good people, or your good people start slacking off and you start having a situation where you feel like you can pull your own hair out because suddenly your employees are not a great team anymore, right? So we want to look at preventing that. You really want to prevent these things before they happen because otherwise, you are really sinking your own ship. <laughs> Remember in episode 19, when we were talking about this, that you are the leader, the buck stops with you. So I often come across business owners and entrepreneurs who blame their employees or their organization or their industry. And you know what, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking a lot of the times, hmm, yo, I don't know about that. You are really the leader. So if your organization is this dysfunctional, you are probably not really taking a good look at things that you should be doing differently in your organization, right? And with that being said, I want you to just remember this quick tip. This is a great tip that was given to me many times in my business. And this is, if you can avoid a problem before it even is a problem, that is the best way, right? Prevention is definitely better than cure. So if you implement these things that we are talking about today, you are going to save yourselves potentially a lot of headaches, right? You don't want to end up with horribly dysfunctional people working for you, making your entire organization dysfunctional. You really do not want that to happen. So we are going to prevent that. That, right? We don't want that at all. Okay. So it can be more time consuming and requires a bit more effort and patience, but it saves us a lot of time, money, and hassles if we hire the right people for the right job right from the start. We will be looking at 15 traits of ideal employees as per an article written for Forbes by Ken Sundheim, a published author, as well as the founder of and CEO of Sales and Marketing at KAS Placement. This episode is very much linked to episode 19 of Your Creative Force in which we discuss the importance and traits of successful leaders. Okay, so Ken Sundheim, we're going to look at something he wrote today. Ken Sundheim is spelled K-E-N for his name and his last name is Sundheim. S-U-N-D-H-E-I-M. So go look him up. This guy really knows what he's talking about, right? <laughs> so let's jump into part one of our show. And we're going to start off by looking at 15 things to remember before we even hire anyone for any reason at all. I'm going to go through these 15 things and then we are going to move on in part two and three of our show to what Mr. Sondheim is bringing to the table for us, right? So the first thing you want to remember before before you even hire anyone for any reason at all is that character trumps all. Without character, no talent can truly ever make up for the costly and unforeseen issues you will encounter. I'll give you a quick example from a business I used to have back in the day when I was still in South Africa. I had a business that were about creating custom made murals, which is paintings on walls, intricate fine art paintings on walls for clients, right? And this was the only time I fired someone in that business. And the reason was because he had a bad attitude towards my clients. He was cocky. He was talking down to my clients. And he was this way because he was supremely gifted. He was a really good artist and he did good artwork for me. But he kept giving me problems because he couldn't 
behave himself. He couldn't control his impulsive way of engaging with my clients on the project. And one day I showed up on the project and I just told him, don't even come back because you are costing me clients. And I had to fire him right there on the spot. It was awful. I was really sad that I had to lose him because he was such a great artist, but it was just not worth it for me to have someone who ticks off my clients all the time, right? So if you want to avoid costly mistakes and really struggling with issues in your work environment, I really want to implore you to look at someone's character. In interviews, you could ask them questions, do a bit of research, do a bit of homework on this, and make sure that if you interview someone, you include some questions that kind of test their character. You want to look at the person and watch their body language, watch the person for who they really are, not just think about it. Would you want to be friends with this person? Is this a person of good character, of good standing that you would want to be friends with if you didn't have to hire them, right? That's a good question to ask. And I know there are many articles and many tips online that you can find about how to test someone's character in an interview, just through clever questioning. And it's not to trip people up. It's not to catch people out. Okay, and <laughs> and you must be assuming that sometimes people will just be nervous, right? And answer those questions. Maybe they will answer the question it's really badly <laughs> because they're nervous. So you have to consider that. But you can find out a lot about a person's character by summing them up in person. That's why it's so important when you can to interview someone in person or at least through video when you are doing it online, right? Because you can tell things about a person. Then, number two, nobody is perfect. You have to have mercy on people when they make mistakes, okay? So especially when people are new in an organization, they are nervous. They're still learning about your organization. And even people in management positions can make mistakes. They can have an error in judgment or they could encounter a problem that they simply don't know how to solve, right? That happens. So if you think that people you're going to hire are always going to make perfect choices, say always the perfect things and do always the things exactly the way you want, you're not being realistic. People are people. You are hiring people. You are not hiring robots. You have to remember that. So have mercy on people when they make mistakes and remember that nobody is perfect. Number three, you need to really know what you want the person to be responsible for in their job, right? If you're saying to someone, I'm hiring you to be an administrative assistant, you have to be very clear with them about the boundaries of their job and also about the responsibilities of their job. If this is someone who's going to be face to face with your clients, if this is someone who's going to be in charge of handling big responsibilities like working with the money or going to the bank for you or doing certain tasks that requires them to be responsible and places them in a position of authority, you're going to have to be very clear with them on that. And you're going to possibly in the beginning, especially you're going to have to re uh, reinforce that with them and keep reminding them of their responsibilities to show up at a certain time to do the job in a certain way. You might need to repeat that a few times and really reinforce to them what their job is about. You have to be very clear, right? And for the most part, you may even want to put that very clearly stipulated in a contract with this person, right? Be very clear and then stick to that. Don't work someone into the ground by suddenly expecting of them all these unwritten responsibilities that was never part of the deal for them in the first place. If you need to change their contract or upgrade their contract to include new responsibilities, discuss it with them. Make sure they are willing and able to take on these responsibilities before you just assume that they are going to do so. So really know what you want the person to be responsible for in their job and be sure to communicate that to them very effectively and ongoingly and change it with their input and knowledge as you go if you need to, right? Number four, you need to consider building the person in the process, not just care about the job they do. If your people 
are good people, especially, you want to develop your people. Send them to leadership seminars. Do training sessions with them. Make sure that you help them also achieve their own goals and their own career um expectations, right? They want to, if you're going to hire someone who is smart and capable, I can guarantee you they are going to want to develop themselves through this job. They're not going to be satisfied just sitting there and being like a robot doing a job. So consider the fact that you're working with people and that as the leader, you have some degree of responsibility for helping your people to grow and develop. Don't Stick someone in a job and just keep them there in the shadows because you're scared of losing them. Because you know what? If they have anything between them ear their ears, you will lose them anyway, if that's what you do, right? Just help them, come alongside them, develop them and grow them. Number five, remember to care about people more than about things. Okay. If something goes wrong, if you have a crisis in your business, okay, be very careful of turning on your people and just blaming them and blasting them. Be careful of doing that. It might have been a circumstance outside of their control. Okay. People are always more important than things. Remember that. Okay. If someone accidentally broke a very heavy piece of office equipment and it's very expensive to replace, okay, you you need to have insurance for stuff like that. You can't turn around and destroy someone <laughs> over something like that. That is still a human being and you need to treat people with utmost respect and put people before things. Things can always be changed. Things can always be replaced. But people have hearts and people have feelings and you do have to realize that you are not working with machines, right? You are working with people. Number six, never take people for granted. Don't just assume that someone is happy in their job. Don't just assume that they immediately know and understand every aspect of their job and know what to do and are just going to do it brilliantly from the get-go. You have to give leadership. You have to provide training. You have to provide them with assistance. You have to be approachable. It is on you to make sure that people are not taken for granted. Remember their birthdays. Remember their families, things that are important to them. They have personal lives. These are human beings, right? Always remember that. Number seven, if you take care of your employees first, they will take care of your business. Employees come before clients or customers. This is something I actually learned from reading up on the way the very famous philanthropist and entrepreneur Richard Branson does his business. This is a quote that he's famous for, that you actually need to put your employees before your customers and your clients. I have found that to be very true in my own business. When I take good care of my employees, when I make sure they are happy, they are clear on their expectations, they feel safe, they feel trusted, they feel inspired, then they automatically bring that to the table. And my whole organization is uplifted and functions much more better because of that. Okay, so remember that. Number eight, don't play games with people out of fear. Okay, sometimes your business will hit some roadblocks or obstacles. But what a lot of business owners do, I find, is they try and hide this from their employees, almost like a parent would hide difficult realities from their children for a time to kind of try and protect them. But you have to really... Ask yourself, seriously, are you protecting them or are you actually just keeping them in the dark about something that is really impacting them? Because that may not be the best way of handling it. There are ways to communicate things successfully to your employees, even difficult truths or difficult facts about your business. But you need to be honest. If your employees think that you are lying to them, 
hiding things from them, what that typically leads to is they draw their own conclusions. And then you have a whole other issue at hand because now people are probably freaking themselves out, <laughs> believing a lot of things that might not even be true. And you really causing people tremendous stress in the process by not being upfront with them. I am very transparent with my employee employees in general. I do not tell them every single thing that is the inside and outside of my business if it does not relate to them. But when it directly impacts them, I am very honest with them. I give them the facts. I make sure they know exactly where they stand with me, where they stand with their job at all times. I don't play games with them because I don't want them to feel unsafe in the business environment. Okay. Number nine, do not be afraid to fire people if you really need to. Sometimes people turn a blind eye to things that should really cause them to fire a person. If someone is drinking on the job or stealing from your business or simply sitting there not really doing their job at all, these are reasons for firing people. And you know what I've seen? A lot of time people run into issues with this if they have employed their friends or their family members and they are too scared to fire them because they are too scared that it will have huge repercussions on their relationship with the person, right? Or I I've seen them do that because they feel sorry for someone. Someone may have really horrible circumstances and they feel so sorry for the person that they just keep them on and they're not really firing them when they should. And I want to tell you, you are in that case, not being a leader, you're being an enabler of dysfunction. There's a huge difference. I will give people chances to fix their behavior, to adjust their attitude or to come clean with me if that may be the case that they need to do that. But if they persist in behavior that is undermining my business or my organization's reputation, I will absolutely fire them. I will not have any problem doing so. And if you are too scared to fire someone who gives you true bad issues in your business, you're going to have a lot of headaches. You're going to make your entire organization toxic and you're going to end up with resenting your employees and they will in turn resent you, resent your business or simply not have any respect for you, right? So the other thing we want to look at, number 10, try to reward good behavior and recognize employees for their wins. I give out awards. I give out gift cards to my employees to thank them if they put in an extra effort. I make sure I recognize them. I try and pay them well, paying people fairly and justly. That is the foundation. You have to pay people well and treat them with respect, okay? If you treat your employees like they are just your little slaves and you are their master cracking the whip all the time, not a good scenario. Not good for you, not good for your business culture, definitely awful for your employees. And you will probably find that you get, as a result, a huge staff turnover. People won't stay with your organization if they feel like your ways are abusive to them. Okay. You really have to not only not be um, emotionally or verbally or organizationally abusive to your people, but you have to be aware of their strengths and their wins and you have to acknowledge it in meetings. You have to reward them financially or give out awards to your employees. That all builds really good business culture and it makes it so that people feel proud of their job that they are doing for you. So remember that. Number 11, don't make the mistake of thinking that certain perks at work will take the place of you being a true leader to your employees. I have seen this many times. You walk into a business, they have free snacks and free drinks and pool tables in the corner and a nice lounge where people can relax during lunch. And maybe they even have some assistance for people with daycare or things like that. And they have all these great perks. But when you look at the people, <laughs> they look like zombies. They're overworked. They're tired. They're not really happy. And they complain. I've seen this. I've 
have walked into businesses and and have seen this where people have all the perks but the job itself the business the organization the environment is completely dysfunctional it's gray it's drab the leaders are bad people are treated like robots so I want to tell you this, okay? Big organizations often have this advantage that they can give a lot of perks like free lunches or free gym or free whatever to their employees. But I want to tell you it is more important to treat people well and provide them with a happy, safe, trusting work environment than it is to give them tons of perks and they're still unhappy because you're still treating them badly, <laughs> okay? People are not your possessions in your business. They are people and they're not there for you to control beyond any reasonable expectations in their jobs. They are there to serve you and you are there as a leader to serve them. Okay. And this is a little tip I'll give you on the side. A great leader is a great servant. You want to be a good leader, then serve your people well. Okay? And don't take advantage of them and don't believe that perks and things like that can replace having a healthy, stable work environment and you being a true leader. You can't just sit back and think, oh, they must be happy because they can play a game of pool during lunch. <laughs> no, 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 no. You have to be hands on. You have to know what's going on. You have to really care about the people, right? Then remember that contractors or employees too, in a way, include them. Sometimes when someone is sitting remotely doing work for the, for your business, they kind of feel like they're an outsider. They may not participate in all the wonderful things that is happening in the moment in your business. They may not be clued in to all your wins and all your excitement, right? <laughs> they may not feel as inspired. So remember to let them know, include them, praise them, make them also feel included and appreciated in your business. That is very very important. Number 13, do not hire people just because you like them. They must actually be good at what they do. Okay. I once, I'm going to use an interesting example here. I once saw someone who has tattoos all over their body and some of their tattoos are amazing beautiful artistically executed tattoos I can admire those because to me that is like an art form <laughs> I am way too much of a sissy to ever get tattoos but I can admire it on other people and then I noticed that on his one arm he had some tattoos that I thought wow those are kind of not looking nearly as great as the others right and so since I knew him well I asked him why are those tattoos so different looking from the other tattoos that you have on your body that look really nice and he said to me oh I really like the tattoo artist right and I didn't didn't comment further I just told him that I liked his tattoos and I think they were nice and I kind of left it at that but I was thinking to myself you know you have these beautiful wonderful tattoos on your body and then you let someone tattoo you on your arm who clearly didn't do a great job and now for the rest of your life you are stuck with these awful looking tattoos on your one arm that clearly looks terrible compared to the other tattoos on your body that look amazing, right? And this to me is a good analogy of this, okay? People must be good at their job. You can't just employ someone because you like them. They have to have the skills that you actually need. So don't confuse liking someone with them actually being a good choice for the job, okay? That's something you need to remember. Number 14, do not hire people just because they think exactly like you. They need to be more than yes men. They must be able to supplement your weaknesses with strengths of their own. I have an employee like this who is wonderful to me. His name is Daniel and I can absolutely rely on Daniel. He will always tell me where he thinks I have blind spots and we work very well together because we can do that. Okay, uh, Daniel's not his real name, but I'm just using Daniel for his name in the scenario because um, I don't want to embarrass him. <laughs> but he's fantastic because he knows my weaknesses and he can totally tell me where I have weaknesses and blind spots. And we're very open with each other. And because of him, my business is more successful. He's not exactly like me, but he's really great and has his own strengths that he brings to the table, which my business 
really needs, okay? Then lastly, number 15, provide a friendly, safe environment for employees where they can trust that you will be a good leader and you are also trusting them. If you can trust the people who work for you, you can stay hands off with a lot of things in your business and you will build a good relationship with your employees. But you have to be the leader who provides them with this kind of environment. Be a approachable, be open, don't be derogatory or mean or obtuse or anything like that with regards to your employees. Make sure that you really are there for them. Okay. <laughs> and with that, we're going to conclude part one of our show today. And in part two, we're going to look at 15 traits of ideal employees. Okay. This is our episode, Hiring Great Employees, episode 20 of Your Creative Force. And we'll be back with part two after the break. Catch the fire of creativity. Visit artbyavian.com. A V I A N N E. And now we return to our show. And we are back with part two of our show today, episode 20, Hiring Great Employees. And this is, of course, part of our radio show, Your Creative Force. So with that, let's jump right into what Ken Sundheim was writing about in Forbes. And he wrote a very cool article called The 15 Traits of the Ideal Employee. I want to share these 15 traits with you and then elaborate on them as we speak. And so, yes, let's uh, go right ahead. Now, Ken Sondheim wrote about these 15 traits, and I am going to quickly mention them to you, and then I'm going to go and um, mention some more facts about this. So, let's go ahead. The 15 traits of the ideal employee in summary is that they, they, they are action oriented. They're intelligent. They're ambitious. They're autonomous. They display leadership. They are a cultural fit. They're upbeat. They're confident. They're successful. They're honest, they're detail-oriented, they are modest, they are hardworking, marketable, and passionate. Those are the 15 traits that he is writing about in this wonderful article, 15 Traits of the Ideal Employee. Go look that up online under Ken Sundheim, 15 Traits of the Ideal Employee by um, Forbes magazine, right? So, before we jump into these 15 traits, you have to remember that building the right team is critical for any business. Finding the right people who can match your own creative force in terms of being authentically invested in their own journey alongside yours is critical. Okay, And here I'm going to mention something very interesting about your creative force. Remember how in the beginning of our episodes, in the first episodes of our radio show, we were talking a lot about your creative force and what your creative force really is and what is creativity and how to dig for your treasures as part of discovering your own creative force and really operating authentically from your creative force. Now, here's a little twist on that for you. Okay, are you ready? This is really good stuff. <laughs> okay, your creative force, when you start out building that inside of you, is kind of an unseen thing, right? But your creative force becomes something tangible when you start leading people because those people become physical manifestations of your creative force. Think about it. These people are helping you build your business, your dreams, achieving your goals, absolutely attaining self-actualization and the fact that you are bringing to the world the awesomeness that you can bring to the world, right? So the physical manifestations of that, that includes your people. Your people are, in fact, in reality, literally your creative force that are working right alongside you to make all that happen. 
okay? I want you, if you need to, to pause the show right here for a moment and think about that for a while because this is hugely powerful. If you can live from this little secret I just shared with you, huge impact. Much power to you because your creative force is multiplied in a literal creative force that consists of actual human beings. Remember that, right? You and your team, you are your creative force in reality, literal reality. How cool is that, right? <laughs> so is your mind blown a little bit right now? Good. Okay, so we're going to jump into the 15 traits of the ideal employee that Ken Sondheim is writing about here. Okay. And he writes, when hiring for any size business, it's not what the candidates know today. Okay. Knowledge is a very fluid thing today, because if someone doesn't know a certain skill or a certain part of knowledge that they need for a certain job, they can literally just jump online, do some courses and catch up on that. Okay. So that is not the be all and end all today anymore. It's just knowing stuff, right? Information can always be taught. The most intelligent companies hire on future success and heavily weigh personality when determining the most apt employees. This is what he's writing, right? So remember what I told you, character trumps all. Remember that you have people with great work ethic, great character. You got a winner. Okay. If they don't know all the information, they can learn that. But a character cannot be taught. That was the job of their mom, <laughs> their teachers, their coaches. Or if they didn't have any of that, then it was their job to make sure that they come to you already with a good attitude and a good character. That is not your job to teach someone that. Your job is to train them and help them succeed, right? Your job is not to build things into them that they should already come with, right? Regardless of industry, pay, age, or sex, all ideal employees, Ken writes, share some common traits. These include but are not limited to individuals who can be described as or possess the following. And here he goes straight up into the 15 traits. First, as we've already mentioned, he goes into people who are action oriented. You have to understand, as a side note, I just want to mention this. A lot of people can talk up a good game. There are people in all walks of life, in all industries, everywhere you go, networking meetings, just your kids' school, they can talk up a good game. Most people talk up a good game because they want to appear successful. But really, the good game they're talking, in reality, it all comes down to show me the goods, right? The proof is in the pudding. You have to take action. You have to show me what you've achieved. Show me your actions of what you are busy working towards. I don't want to hear all the cool stuff you're doing or have done as much as I want to see you struggling with things to succeed, going, showing up, appearing for meetings, doing the hard work, being patient with yourself, showing me the character, right? The actions matter. You have to hire, Ken writes, employees who take action and take chances. While chances may lead to failure, they will more often lead to success and mold confidence while generating new ideas. Stagnant employees won't make your company money. Action-oriented employees will. Okay, like Daniel, I've mentioned before in part one, he always comes to me with great ideas, with doable steps or how we of how we can work towards achieving things in the business, what we will be looking at long term to do with certain things that he's working on in the business. And he always takes initiative. I love employees like that because I don't have to constantly hold their hands or exhaust myself to the point of no return, just trying to get them to do their jobs, right? They can take responsibility. They can take action and they can come up with cool strategies, ideas, and they can take chances, right? And if he fails, it fails, right? But I'm going to back him and I'm going to run with him when he has good ideas because I like the kind of employee he is. I like the kind of person he is. And I know that in the long run, that kind of attitude from him is going to help us get places, right? We're going places in our business. And I know already that Daniel and I, we have a long-term thing going here because we are on the same page. He's super action-oriented and I know we're going places, right? So action-oriented, the first trait. You have to remember that. Then trait number two 
is intelligence, okay? Intelligence is not the only thing, but it is a strong foundation for success. While there are many variables you can be flexible on when hiring, intelligence is a must or you're going to be spending an abundance of time proofing work, micromanaging and dealing with heightened stress levels, okay? When I go to bed at night, I do not want to lie awake wondering if my employees can do the job or not. <laughs> I have other things to worry about. I have to balance the books. I have to make sure we get new students. I have to make sure I do a good job with my clients or we don't have a business. I have to work on certain things and I need to trust that my contractors, my employees can do the stuff I'm paying them to do, right? So I hire people who are smart and action oriented people who can get the job done. Now, here's the thing, okay? Remember what we mentioned in part one of our show? You have to have mercy on people and you have to have patience, right? Nobody's going to walk into a job and just do it perfectly the first time forever, okay? You're going to have to spend a little time with people, showing them the ropes, making sure they really know what you want them to do and how you want them to do it, right? Right now, I'm actually in the process of rewriting some things in my business. Amongst other things, I'm writing an upgraded teacher's manual because I realize that hiring more and more teachers, every teacher has a different style and a different approach. And though I'm totally cool with that and I encourage teachers to have unique and individual approaches because it benefits my students, I just started realizing that I totally need to make sure that they actually cover the stuff that I want them to cover. There's certain things I really want them to hit the nail on the head with when it comes to teaching certain things to my students. So I've decided that I really need to upgrade my um, job requirements for them and making sure that they really understand what I expect the students to know, right? My outcomes for my classes. I need to be very specific and I need to elaborate on that more. So what does that mean? I actually have to write a teacher's manual to them to make sure that they get it. And then I'm going to organize a training day and I'm going to get everyone together and I'm going to make sure that everyone is on the same page. And I will probably do that once or twice a year just to make sure that all my teachers really know and are really sharp on what I want them to absolutely not miss in a classroom when they are teaching students, right? Very important. So intelligence matters. You have to have intelligent people to work with, right? I do not. And here's the thing, right? If you don't have people who, who have intelligence and are action oriented, you're going to end up with what we could call a lot of duds in your situation, in your job environment. You do not want your organization to be a cruise ship for people who just want to get a paycheck every month. That will not help them to grow. That will not help you to grow. And in the long term, it's going to make not only your employees stagnant and bring in a very complacent culture into your business, it's also going to make your entire organization stagnant or even toxic, where you can't get them to do anything out of the box and you can't get them to take any initiative. So you really want to make sure your people have intelligence. That doesn't mean everyone has to have 150 IQ. <laughs> <laughs> what it means is they have to be bright enough and smart enough and driven enough and gifted enough that they are willing to take initiative and they can actually follow your instructions and that they are actually going to want to do a good job for you and they have that desire, right, to learn and they are teachable and they are able to process new information and not just sit in a dark little corner somewhere getting a paycheck, <laughs> right? That's important. So getting back to what Ken was writing, number one, right, was action-oriented, number two is intelligent and number three is ambitious. Employees can only help your company if they want to help themselves, have a better career. Ambitious is what makes a company innovative. It's what spawns creative ideas and what generates candor and openness amongst employees, right? A super duper creative business that allows new ideas and fresh ideas and would try out things, especially in the beginning of your business when you don't have a lot of established hierarchies and you don't have a lot of um, moving parts yet to consider. This is the time when you really want your employees to 
bring that amb- ambition and to help you drive success and build your business. But it also goes for long term, right? You always want people who are enthusiastic, who are inspired. And people have to be ambitious from within themselves. They have to want to make something of themselves, right? I don't want to employ someone to be a classroom assistant and for the rest of the time they work for me in my art academy, they are only an art room assistant, right? Eventually, I would want them to become an instructor. I would want them maybe to run their own programs and maybe I can even employ them to be a faculty director for me, right? I want to be able to have them have opportunities in my business. But for that to be reality for them, I absolutely need them to be self-starters in the sense of being ambitious. I cannot be ambitious on someone's behalf. You have to understand that. Getting back to what Ken writes, number four is autonomous. You are hiring an employee who can get the job done without extensive handholding. As the owner of the company, you have your own tasks to take care of. And when you delegate activities to the individual whom you're hiring, you don't want 20 questions, rather you want execution. Guys, sometimes people can drive you crazy because they just want you to give them every single detail and spoon feed them everything and they never want to take initiative and it's like they're afraid to fail, right? People who constantly want affirmation and attention, it's a bit of a red flag for me because they start dragging me down. They start being emotionally exhausting, right? So I look at people who are ambitious, who are intelligent, who are action-oriented and who are autonomous, who can do things for themselves, okay? Then Ken writes, number five is to display leadership. Do you see this individual being a significant part of your company and leading future employees of the firm? Leadership begins with self-confidence is molded by positive reinforcement and repetitive success okay now here's the thing if someone comes to me and works for me and they have low self-esteem can I use them for a job? Probably. They can probably be a decent classroom assistant. But when I'm looking at them, and that is where they're stuck at inside themselves, unless um, they can become inspired to overcome that, I'm probably not going to put them in front of a classroom as an instructor because they do not exude confidence, right? And I know enough to know that if you do not exude confidence as an instructor, your students are not going to be very confident about your leadership and your instruction in the classroom, right? So when you are looking at employees, especially employees that you wish to promote and that you wish to run with for the long term, you have to make sure they display leadership. So along with being action-oriented, intelligent, ambitious, and autonomous, they have to display leadership qualities, okay? Number six, and this goes for everyone in your organization, from the person who cleans your floors (laughs) to the person who eventually becomes your higher ups in your company, right? You treat everyone the same. You you look at everyone the same in this regard, but they must be a cultural fit, okay? If they are going to be cross crossing you on everything, if they're going to start being an obstacle for you to run a successful operation where people get along and there's a peaceful, harmonious environment at the job, they're going to cause you problems, okay? So they must be a cultural fit. And you have to ask yourself, like what Ken writes here, are you going to enjoy working with this individual on a daily basis? Are your employees going to enjoy working with this individual? When recruiting, personality can mean the difference between an employee who doesn't stay long and fails to produce versus an all-star who is going to significantly increase your competitive advantage, right? As a side note here, I'll just mention, whenever I hire hire someone, I make sure they also are a good fit with my other employees, okay? If my other employees cannot stand them at all, even if I like them, I will not hire them because it's going to cause me endless headaches, right, within my organization. So you have to consider this. They must be a cultural fit. And then number seven, upbeat. Employees who come into work fresh and energetic every day are going to outproduce workers who think negatively and easily burn out when they encounter defeat. Upbeat and optimistic employees create a working environment that is unique, spawns new ideas, and just as important, is enjoyable for the other people involved, okay? You want a super happy operation. You want people to come in fresh, inspired, full of ideas, ambitious, right? That's 
what you want. That is what keeps your organization a cut above the rest. Remember that. <laughs> and before we go on with number eight, we are going to end part two of our show here, and we'll be back with part three after the break. Talent is a flame. Genius is a fire. And now we return to our show with your host, Avian. And we are back with part three of episode 20 of Your Creative Force today. Our theme being hiring great employees. And we're going to continue going through the article written by Ken Sondheim for Forbes about the 15 traits of ideal employees. Okay, so number eight, confident. Confidence produces results and encourages employees to take on challenges that others shy away from. The best companies are highly confident in their abilities to provide a superior product or service that, and this belief spawns a culture of improvement and client confidence. Okay, quick side note, there's a huge difference between confidence and cockiness. <laughs> I love confidence, but I don't like cockiness. When someone thinks they know it all and they come across as they always want to upstage other people and they're very cocky about everything, it's kind of a downturn. It's kind of a turnoff for my clients and for me. And so I don't really like cockiness, but I love and absolutely encourage confidence okay and once again for me this is a respect thing this is really a matter of character so make sure that you really know the difference between confidence and cockiness okay people need to be respectful they can be confident and they can do that very well without being cocky about it Okay, and so you need to really <laughs> know the difference between confidence and cockiness. But Ken is absolutely right. Confidence is of critical importance because if people aren't confident, if they don't believe in their own ideas and their own value that they can bring to the company, if they don't bring their own creative force to the company, then what are they really there for? Just a paycheck, right? And you want more than people who are there just for a paycheck. So that being said, Ken writes number nine as being successful. One of the most effective ways to predict future success in a candidate is their past success at other firms. Have they remained at companies for a prolonged period? Have they met company goals? What achievements have these individuals accomplished? If one looks closely, a lot can be deciphered from a resume. Okay. On this topic, I agree with Ken. Previous successes do bode well for me, but I do not only look at qualifications. Okay. Sometimes great people may not have all the right paperwork or all the right ducks in a row, but they may be a fantastic fit. So you need to, you need to take into account previous successes and previous ventures that they were part of and how well they fared in those. Um, but you also want to be aware that a resume may not fully reflect everything this person is about if they wrote the resume to appeal to a certain audience, right? You have to dig a little deeper. Okay, will require a little more patience, but go a little deeper and make sure you really have an accurate understanding of the successes and strengths that this person bring to the table past just what their qualifications or affiliations in the past were, right? Remember that. Ken writes number 10 as being the quality of being honest. Absolutely. I cannot agree with Ken Moore. He writes, an employee can have all the talent in the world, but without integrity and authenticity, nothing great will be accomplished. If nothing else, you want honest, forthright employees at your organizations. Otherwise, your company will turn off clients and ultimately won't survive, right? No BS. My policies are very straightforward. For me, I can tell you guys, honestly, side note, my policies are very BS free, right? I just don't want people full of nonsense and games and BS. I want them straight up. Once again, honesty comes down to great character. Okay, remember that. Moving on to what Ken writes, number 11, detail-oriented. Attention to detail is crucial or mistakes will be made within your company. 
detail-oriented employees take pride in their work. They dot the I's, cross the T's, and get the job done. So you want people who are methodical for the most part, right? For me, this goes together with intelligence and ambition. People who are intelligent and ambitious will usually care about the details because they actually care about their job, right? So remember that. Number 12, this is what I kind of mentioned when we were talking about number eight, which is confidence, is people who are modest, right? The most sought after employees shout their value, not through their words, but rather through their work. They are humble. They don't need to pump themselves up in front of others and quietly outproduce those who do, right? So number 12, modest. No cockiness, right? I don't want to hear you talk a bunch of nonsense and make yourself sound good. I want to see your actions, right? So that goes back again to number one, be action oriented. And then number 12, be modest, right? Number 13, I want them to be hardworking, like Ken says here. Nothing great is accomplished easily. Nothing great is accomplished via hiring nine to five employees, right? People who just sit there for a paycheck, as I've mentioned before. Rather, he writes, the foundation of an effective organization lies in its ability to recruit results-oriented, hardworking employees who can execute, right? Action-oriented. You want people who are hardworking. I don't want people just sitting around at their job, looking at social media, twiddling their thumbs, not getting anything done, right? When we work, we work. When we play, we play. But we are all hardworking. And you know what? You need to lead by example. You need to be there. You need to show up. You need to be hardworking. If you're not, your employees are not going to do it for you. Okay? <laughs> Remember that. Number 14, be marketable. By marketable, gain means being presentable to clients. Business is not a fashion contest, nor do looks dictate success. However, most successful applicants are well put together. And when dealing with clients are going to represent your organization as professional and organized. Okay. So I don't personally expect people to dress in suits and ties, right? That doesn't really go well with my industry, but I do expect them to show up looking tight looking neat and looking ready for work, right? My employees dress decently and they're always very well put together and they show a good work ethic also in part by how they dress and how they look, right? And appearing marketable and professional to my clients. Very important. Then number 15, passionate. Last but not least, employees who are passionate about their job never work a day in their life. While money should be a motivator in all individuals whom you hire, make sure that they enjoy the journey when pursuing that end goal. Okay, remember that. These are very important traits that we can't go without. I'm quickly going to summarize what Ken Sundheim wrote, and I'm going to just go over these 15 traits again. Number one, action-oriented. Number two, intelligent. Number three, ambitious. Number four, autonomous. Number five, display leadership. Number six, a cultural fit. Number seven, upbeat. Number eight, confident. Number nine, successful. Number 10, honest. Number 11, detail-oriented. Number 12, modest. Number 13, hardworking. Number 14, marketable. Number 15, passionate. So there you have it. And with our quote of the day, we are going to end part three of our show. Our quote for the day is, the best executive is the one who has sense enough to pick good men to do what he wants done and self-restraint enough to keep from meddling with them while they do it. And this quote is from the American statesman Theodore Roosevelt. And with that, I'll be seeing you next time on your creator force. Talent is a flame. Genius of fire. Visit us at artbyavian.com. Tune in next time as we explore your creative force. Thank you for listening.